Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give God your praise. Come on, come on church, wherever you are. Let everything that have breath praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And God, we thank you for the strength that you pour into us day in and day out, that you are our strength when we are weak. And God, I just pray that in this moment you remind someone under the sound of my voice, God, that you are uh, their strong God, that you will go before them, God, that you've already paved a way, God, that you want good for them, God. You're not you know, a mean God. You're so kind and you're so compassionate, God. So may we feel that in this moment. Would you wrap your loving, strong arms around your children, God? Would you whisper to them? Would you remind them right now, in the name of Jesus, that you are working all things together, even the things that seem out of sort, all the things in our lives, you're working it all together for this church, for such a time as this, and no weapon formed against your body of Christ, your people will prosper. And we declare all of this in the mighty, strong name of Jesus. Church, say amen. Amen. But you can go ahead and have a seat as we continue. Well, it is so good to have you this weekend joining us. I want to welcome those of you joining us online and also welcome our growing Thursday night uh, recording audience. Great to have you all as well. And just so you know, if you're joining us online, though we are a growing audience in our recording, there's still room for you. So we'd love to have you in one of our upcoming Thursday night recordings. Uh, we want to let you know that the we as Willow Creek, we are a church that really wants to connect people to Jesus, really connect with one another in a meaningful way and really build community. And we also want to be a, a transformative community as we relate to our world. And so if you love to get more involved in Willow Creek, we would love for you to do so. You can find out more how by just going to willowcreek.org slash next steps. Now, a couple of really important things we want to let you know about. Uh, as we mentioned to all of us, we are very excited to put a target on the calendar March the 7th, that we're going to be reopening in-person worship on the weekend. So we're really excited about that. And so make plans to, to join us uh, on March the 7th. Now, one of our greatest needs on March the 7th is going to be in the area of volunteerism. So we very strategically placed our two weekend services right next to each other so that you could serve one and then you could also attend one. And so if you're not yet volunteering, we would love to invite you to serve in one of our many ministries, whether it's in our kids ministry, our junior high ministry, special friends, guest experience, there is a role and a place for you. And so a couple of ways you can let us know if you're interested in serving. Uh, if you're joining us online, you can just simply go to willowcreek.org slash serve. Or if you're in the room, once you leave the room today, you'll see some boards in the lobby. It's contactless. It's, it's, it's safe and secure, but you'll find out some opportunities that you can scan on your phone. We love to get you engaged that way, but we'd love for you to do so. We would love to, uh, to join together as we serve our community come March the 7th. Now that's March the 7th. Let me also tell you what's happening February the 7th, which is next weekend we have our small group kickoff. And so if you're not yet a part of a small group, again, one of our heartbeats is to make sure that we all get connected together in community. So if you're not yet in a group, we would love to help you get in a group. Uh, if you want to lead a group, we would love to help you take that step as well. So you can let us know that by just going to willowcreek.org slash groups. Now, again, our heartbeat as a church is to really make a difference making the church in the life of so many people. And as you may know, it's kind of a tradition and a rhythm around here at Willow that we do what we call prison packs. So we pack a, a gift for every incarcerated inmate in the state of Illinois and even in some neighboring states as well. And it's a really great opportunity that we just have to, to love and serve those that, that maybe sometimes don't feel the love and support of, of many. And so these gifts get sent out before Christmas, but what you may not know is we hear back from a lot of those inmates. And so over the last few weeks, we've received literally hundreds of letters of inmates just expressing thanks. I thought I would share one of those letters with you. Here's one, what one person wrote. They said, hello, and God bless you. I received your blessing and just felt the need to say thank you. First and foremost, I'm uneducated, so please forgive my spelling, grammar, and any other literary mistake. And it says, your gift was the brightest part of my incarceration thus far. To remember us is a kindness, and I'm so grateful that you took the time to do so. I'm a sinner, and I've really tried to, 
uh, to give God my life, but I failed over and over again. Truthfully, I've even stopped trying to better myself because I felt like God didn't even care about me. I felt alone in the cosmos, and that's just a really terrible feeling. And although I can't lie to you, say that reading the material instantly changed my heart, it was such an amazing, fresh new start, and I needed that to put me in the right direction. Uh, it, it was a reminder uh, that, that you, uh, it was a reminder as if you will, if, if, for me as the prodigal son, that, that maybe I have failed, but at the same time, I've got a father who waits for me with arms open wide to welcome me back. And it was your church that reminded me, this prisoner, of really what it could look like to return to my father and to set me free. God bless and thank you. What a great story. And again, it's one of literally hundreds of letters like it that, that we received. And so I wanna say thank you for your generosity that's made it possible for us to serve those who are incarcerated uh, in that way. And so as we enter into a time of giving, I think it's always really helpful to us to know that every time we give in these moments, there is a direct correlation between the gift that we give and the life change that God facilitates in the lives of so many people around us. And so I'd love to, to invite you to join us and give in this moment. If you're watching us on willowcreek.tv, uh, all you have to do is to click the give button at the top of the screen and you'll be uh, taken to a screen where you can be prompted in your next step. Or if you'd like to, you can text the word WCSB to the number 77977 and make your gift that way as well. But thank you for your ongoing support of the mission of Jesus right here at, at Willow Creek. Well, today we're going to continue a series we've been in for the last few weeks. It's a series called Game On. And as you saw last week, uh, we, we, we decided to have a little fun and, and put some campus pastors and other members of our executive team in competition with one another uh, my understanding is that I may be a part of the competition today, so I apologize in advance of what you're about to see, uh, but also wanted to let you know that if you find my football skills amazing, uh, I am available for any football team watching, but uh, check this out as we continue our series, Game One. What's up, Willow? Thanks for joining us today as we kick off the fourth week of our Game On series. The sportsmanship between these teams last week, Lauren, was off the charts. Absolutely. And I really can't wait to see what they bring this week. Joe, these teams are really bringing their A game, and I'm sure this week will be no exception. Today, two new teams will be competing in our field goal kickoff challenge. In this challenge, each team will need to choose a kicker and a placeholder. And we also have Rob Campbell here on injured reserve to be our long snapper for both teams. Each team will get two attempts at kicking the ball through the goalpost at the end of the field. The team with the most kick wins. All right, Lauren, give us a rundown of teams. All right, the teams for today's game will be Sean Williams and Sandy Riggs, then Nat Bodmer and Ed Ollie. We got Rob, we got Nat holding, we got Ed kicking. It's gonna be fantastic. Let's go. It's a stiff breeze. Blue fire, see what we can do. Hike. Nat with the hole, right, the, the kick is up, and it is! Oh, just a bit outside! Wide Ugh. right. Just like that much. Wide right. Wide right, my friends. Well to the right. It's okay, though, because as I told you, you gotta just dust yourself off and try again. Hiking in, we got Sandy holding it, and we got Sean, Sean kicking. kicking it. Sean is lining up his kick right now. I'm just saying, it looks like he's pretty serious. Here we go. The hold is down, my friends. The kick is up, and oh. it is. No good, my friends. That was not good. <laughs> let's, let's redo. Hey, I might need some ice for my leg after this is over. Blue 42, hike. All right, Nat with the hold. The kick is up, and it is. Oh. Wide or right? Even wider than we thought. Even wider than the last one, ladies and gentlemen. Even wider. You ready? You ready? Okay, hut, hut, hike! Hike! Oh, the hold is a down. Nice hike. The kick is up, ladies and oh, gentlemen, and it oh, is no, good. No, no. The kick Beautiful. is good. The celebration, <laughs> yes, it is on, my friend. Oh, Party man. time. Yes, Incredible. For those elbows. Rob, For those Sean, elbows. and Sandy. That was phenomenal. It's been a tough round for all of us. Uh, kids, don't give up hope at home. 
one day you might be able to kick bad field goals like me. All right, how's everybody doing tonight? Doing well? It's good to see so many of you coming out tonight. How many, how many of you have not been here in a while? Would you say it's been a while since you've been in? Yeah. Wow, well, we're so glad that you ventured out and joined us tonight. What you just saw on the TV is a, a small example of our next vision. You say, what are you talking about? Well, the T in next was that we would be together one church and one of the ways that we're doing that is bringing campuses together, campus pastors together, departments together, and try and work together more strategically. And there's a lot of work behind that, but we're trying to have a lot of fun behind that as well. And that's a fun example of what's beginning to happen. But I also want to share with you kind of a, an important example of one of the ways that that has happened uh, this week. Um, we got together as a staff, our all staff, where we brought all of our staff together, brought them together socially distanced over in the other auditorium, uh, Lakeside, and uh, we said that Jesus came into the temple courts in John 2, and he up turned uh, the tables and he had a whip and he was chasing out money changers and he said these words, my house shall be a house of prayer. And uh, we said that there's a lot of things that go on in God's house. There's a lot of conversations. There's a lot of fun. There's a lot of worship. There's a lot of preaching. There's a lot of music. There's all kinds of great things, and those are all wonderful. But Jesus decided in that moment to emphasize prayer. And so that group of people that were having fun on that uh, video, along with your entire staff, decided to get together and go out for an hour into different areas of this building and simply pray, and simply ask God to move. And we went around to different departments and we said, God, would you move in students' lives? We came in this room and said, God, would you move in this room? We went up to offices and said, God, be with leadership. We went over to the care center and said, God, help us to reach people in this community in, in practical ways. Father, help us to show the love that you would show. We prayed and we prayed and we prayed for an hour. And then we came back together. And when we came back together, there was a group on stage that led us in worship. And they were the vertical worship band from Harvest Church. And folks have told me that that is kind of a unique deal, that in the past there hasn't been a lot of willow and harvest coming together. And so for our staff and for their team, it was kind of a powerful moment. If they were here, they would tell you this was just sort of a powerful moment of churches coming together and working together. And we were reminded of what Jesus said in John 17, that they may all be one, one church. Working together. In fact, if you ask God, wow, how many churches in the Chicagoland area? If you ask you and me how many are in the Chicagoland area, we might get out the yellow pages or we might start Googling and say, well, there's the Methodists over there and the Baptists over there and you got the Pentecostals over there and you got the Presbyterians over there and you got Harvest over there and Willow over there and missions over there and communities over there. And God would say, whoa, 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 whoa. There's one church. It's my church. Amen. And we ought to all be working together. So I just, yeah, give it up for that. I just wanted to share with you what you are walking into today. You are walking into a house that has been prayed for. There is a new wind blowing in this place. And we welcome it and we ask God for more of it. And I tell you all that, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight. That was just all for free tonight, all right? Uh, but with that in mind, let me pray for us as we begin, all right? Dear Heavenly Father, we, uh, we don't ask for your presence to fill this place. We know you're already here. We just ask that we become more aware of it. Pray, God, that in a sense, uh, when Jesus said, let those who have eyes, let them see. Those who have ears, let them hear. God, help us to have spiritual eyes. Help us to have spiritual ears to see and to hear what it is that you would have for us 
Tonight, we're talking about something so practical, God, something so every day, and yet something that has had so much power in our lives, so much power in our relationships. And God, probably something that we've talked with you about quite often. And so, Lord, even though we're talking about something very practical tonight, I pray that you, by the power of your Holy Spirit, would infuse it with the spiritual lessons that we need to have that would cause us to take our next steps with you. God, great things very rarely happen inside our comfort zones. And so stretch us and call us to something greater and give us the courage to follow you in that. It's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. Well, I got something in the mail this week, and and I wanted to read it to you. Now, I I hesitate to read this because, you know, normally I don't like to, you know, toot my own horn. But this came, and I just thought, man, you, you should know the kind of pastor that you have. It starts out, Dear Reverend Dummett, obviously they know I am a man of God. It said, congratulations, you are among the preferred, select few, pre-approved for our most prestigious credit card. (laughs) Did you hear those words? Preferred, prestigious, select few. It goes on and says, the card, this card is customized to meet all your needs. See, I thought God was supposed to meet all my needs, and I'm so glad to know that all I have to do is worry about this card. It says, enjoy spending all you want. You have set the standard higher, and there's only one platinum card that meets your needs. You deserve it. I kind of thought you would applaud for me in that moment. Like, I mean, that's a high achievement that I was able to to reach, and of course I'm being completely facetious because that's not the only time I've gotten a letter like that. In fact, I've gotten a bunch of letters like that. And you know what? I'm not special because you've gotten a bunch of letters like that, offers like that. In fact, Visa sent one to a three-year-old one time. And MasterCard sent one to a dog one time. They try to suck us in with 0% for six months. They try to suck us in with these high credit limits, limits we can't afford. They try and say, hey, there's cash advances and all kinds of points back and all sorts of things. And it begs the question today, hey, let me ask you, where are you getting your advice on how to manage money? Where are you getting your advice on how to manage money? Jesus over in Matthew 25. Now, this is interesting to me because this is kind of like right before he's going to the cross. So the last things that he's saying, he talked about the sheep and goats. He talked about the prodigal son. He talked about some really important things. And one of the things he gives us is a parable about a business owner who, before he goes away, gives certain sums of money to three people. And there were different sums of money, and he gives them to the people, and he goes away. And the idea is that at some point he comes back, and he holds them accountable. He sees how they did at managing his money. And what Jesus points out for us is really the key to this whole concept of managing money, and that is that when it comes to our money, it's not really our money at all. In fact, it's not the only place in Scripture that that concept plays out. If you look in Haggai 2.8, it says, The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. 1 Chronicles 29.12 says, Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. 1 Corinthians 10.26 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Okay, and so the gist of these verses and the gist of Jesus' parable is that our money is not really ours. It all belongs to God, and we are, we are charged with stewarding his resources, managing it in a way that hopefully when we see him again, he'll say, wow, well done, good and faithful servant. And, you know, I want 
to know what God has to say about managing his money. I hope I'm not going to go to Visa or MasterCard or really any financial institution. I want to figure out what God has to say, especially in a year after the year that we've had. Because this has been a year that has really put a strain on a lot of people's finances. There have been some of us who have had uh, a, a depression, who have been, had boredom, who have had to, had to deal with lots of stuff in the last year. And one of the ways that we've tried to deal with that is to try and make ourselves feel better by buying stuff. There are some of us who have taken the opportunity this year to say, you know what, I'm just going to go ahead and because I want to get this done and that done, I'm going to go ahead and run up more debt on my credit card. There are those of us who have had job loss, who have had wages lost, businesses lost, entire sectors of economy hit in negative ways. Man, you better believe this is a moment where I want to see God. What do you have to say about money? What do you have to say about your money? What do you have to say about the way that I manage what you have given me. And so that's what I want to do with you tonight. I mean, we've never talked about this before. And I know it can get a little tense in church when you talk about money in church. People kind of look at you like, oh, goodness. But I just want you to relax. I just want to give you a couple basic principles from Scripture in regards to what God would say about managing his money. And the first one is from Colossians 3, 23. It says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. There's a passion to the work that we should have as though you were working for the Lord, not for human masters. In other words, we ought to work hard. We ought to be hardworking people. God says, no matter what what is the name that signs your paycheck? Or, 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 or no matter what the name is above you on the org chart or whoever it is that gives you your review, you're not really working for them. You're working for God. And so how much more should we work with passion? How much more should that inform the way that we do our work? Willard Pierce uh, wrote a biography of John Wesley. Any Wesleyans in the house? Any Methodists in the house? I went to a Wesleyan school. And John Wesley started the Methodist movement, the Wesleyan movement. And he said this, uh, Willard Pierce said, Wesley's teaching in regards to finance was very simple, based on Colossians 3.23, the verse that we just read. Wesley would teach his Methodists to earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. Just very simple. He said, the work ethic, this is what's interesting to me, the work ethic of the Methodists became a hallmark of their movement. It was common practice for business owners to seek out Methodists because of their reputation as dependable, honest, and hardworking employees. Did you hear that? I mean, that's just a real interesting byproduct of people following God's word in regards to Colossians 3.23. And it just makes me wonder what it could be like in our cities if when we went for a job interview and they were asking us, oh, let's review your resume, tell me a little bit about yourself, and you say something like, well, yeah, you know, and in my family, our faith is really important, and your employer starts to lean in like, what do you mean? And you say, well, I, I don't know. I, I, you know, I, we go to uh, Willow over there, we're followers of Jesus, and they go, ho, 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 ho. Oh my goodness, we've had some of you Christians before. You guys have got a reputation, and of course now you're just like freaking out. What is he talking about? But he said, no, we've had you before because you guys are some of the most hardworking, some of the best attitude, some of the people with, with just the most integrity. You should have told me earlier on, you're a follower of Jesus. Well, come on. I mean, wouldn't that be cool? That's what was happening with these people. They got that kind of reputation because they thought of themselves as working for God. And I'll tell you this, on the days where it feels like, man, I just don't even know, you know, what am I doing all this hard work for? I mean, don't you feel that way sometimes? It's kind of like, man, it's Monday again, and I'm just thinking I'm working for the weekend, or I'm just working for, you know, the end of my career, or I'm just working for me. I think there's a little more inspiration, a little more motivation when I think, actually, I'm working for God. And, 
And the Bible talks a little bit about a connection between hard work and financial reward. Uh, it says in Proverbs 28, 19, those who work their land will have abundant food. One man said, extraordinary people are just ordinary people who are willing to do the ordinary things other ordinary people aren't willing to do. Working hard. Proverbs 21, 5 says, the plans of the diligent lead to profit. And so we don't want to be workaholics. We don't want to go overboard. But you know what? I want to work as though I'm working for God with a passion. I want to work hard. You know what else I think the Bible would say to us? What I think God would say to us about managing our finances? <laughs> I think God would say it this way. Now, give me a little leeway. I think God would say, ignore those Joneses. You know who I'm talking about? You know who the Joneses are? These mystery people that kind of live down the street from us that we're in sort of a competition with. This idea that when they get a little add-on three-season room to their home, we sort of feel like, man, we got to get a three-season room home in our house. And when they come home with a fancy new car, we think, oh my goodness, we got to get a fancy new car. And when you're talking to them, you out get in the mail and they say, yeah, we're, we're going out to, to Europe this weekend, you know, flying out. And you're like, ah, I want to go out to Europe this weekend. Somebody said, many of us are spending money that we don't have on things we don't need to impress people we don't even like all that much. Does that sound familiar? God says, you know what? Keeping up with the Joneses is kind of pointless. You know what he says in Ecclesiastes 6? By the way, through the richest man who ever lived. I love to hear from people who have been there and done that. And King Solomon was that guy, especially when it comes to success and riches. And, and he said this, enjoy what you have rather than desiring what you don't have. Just dreaming about nice things is meaningless. It's like a, it's like a chasing after the wind. In other words, you're never really satisfied. You're never going to keep up with the Joneses because you know what? As soon as you keep up with the Joneses, oh, the Smiths move in down the street, right? And it's just impossible. There's always somebody that's got a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more, and it just becomes meaningless. And so what do we do about that? Well, what's the antidote to that? Well, I would say enjoy what you have. I would, I would call that gratitude. I would say one of the things we ought to do is to develop a discipline of gratitude. I've told you before, I get out a journal every day. I try to think of five things that I'm grateful for. It develops in you an appreciation for what you have. And then it says, and then, but rather, you know, do that rather than desiring what you don't have. And so I don't want to compare myself. Let's stop comparing ourselves to all these imaginary people around us. Because here's what it does. When you compare yourself with the Joneses, you have one of two outcomes. One is either you win, and then you just feel proud, and that's not very Christ-like, or you lose, and you just feel discontent, and that's not very honoring to God either. Well, how do you do it? How do you just stop comparing? Now, I have to be honest. This is where I kind of depart from scripture a little bit. And that's okay. I just want to give you sort of my advice on how to do this. This doesn't come from the Bible, but how do I stop comparing myself to other people? One is I just declare the Jones is the winner. Like I didn't knock on their door. That would be kind of odd, right? But you just kind of declare them the winner. Just one day, just kind of in your mind, just go, you know what, man, you know what? You win. You just, you win the house competition and you win the car competition and the Christmas light, the Christmas, you gotta see his Christmas lights. You win the Christmas light competition. Like you just, you just win. And I think I've saved thousands of dollars by just declaring them the winner and just moving on. Another thing I do, and th this is maybe less advice and more confession, okay? And I'm just being real. I'm just being authentic is that sometimes, because I'm a car guy, sometimes when I'm, when I'm driving down the road, I'll see somebody in a really fancy car, and I just, oh, I just have a, so I just kind of make up their backstory. I just go, hey, you know what? That guy's probably not happy. 
He's, pro he's probably in debt up to his eyeballs. You know what? He's going home sleeping on a futon because he's got no money. Put all his money in that car. He's probably got an iPhone 6, you know? And I just kind of... So again, I'm just confessing to you. I don't know if you should take that advice, but let's stop comparing and let's develop gratitude. Third thing I'd share with you is let's get wise counsel. Proverbs 11:14 says, in the abundance of counselors, there is safety. You go to any big business, any big corporation, any big organization, and they will have a board of trustees. They will have a financial committee. They will have outdoor or outdoor, outside. They might be outdoor. I don't know if it's in California or Florida. But anyway, outside accounting firms will come in and see the books. That's what we do here at Willow. We have elders, we have a finance committee, we have an outside accountant, a third party accountant that looks over everything that we do because we want to make sure that we have an abundance of counselors because we want that kind of safety and security. We want to make sure that we're making wise decisions. And so every decision that's made around here is looked at by multiple, multiple people. And so my thought for you as individuals, if it's good enough for a big organization, it should be good enough for you. And so as you're making big financial decisions, do you have sort of a personal board of directors, people that you trust, people that you would say, you know what, I'm about to do, make a move here. It's an investment or I'm paying down debt or I'm going to make a tax move or I'm going to buy this or whatever it's going to be. Do you have some people that you trust enough to say, hey, can I run this by you? I want to make sure I'm thinking through this well. You know, I'm 47 years old and yet I still don't make a move financially without calling my dad. I do. He's just on my personal board of directors. Do you have somebody like that? A, a small group? Do you have a, a financial counselor? Do you have somebody? You say, well, no, no, no. I always ask the credit card company if I can afford things. And I never, no, no, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. In fact, let me give you an, uh, uh, just one option. We have a um, ministry around here called Good Sense. I don't know if any of you have taken this class, but this thing is for decades helped people get out of debt, get their money management under God's sort of uh, uh, principles, and it's just been really freeing and helpful for thousands of people. And if you need help in that area of your life, I would encourage you, uh, figure out a way, come sign up for good sense and get some of those, that wise counsel in your life. Now, let me give you another one that I think God would tell us in regards to managing his money. Okay, so this is his money. He wants me to management, manage it in a way that, 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 that would be pleasing to him. I think we ought to give a tithe back to our local church. Now you say, well, I would expect you to say that because you're a pastor and we're in a church and it takes money to run the church, but I'm not really saying that because we need to pay the bills. And I know we're just getting to know each other and you don't know my heart and you don't have any real reason to trust me but I can just tell you that if we sat down over coffee, I would look you straight in the eyes and I would tell you, I believe that this is one of the most important financial principles, not for the church, but for you. And that when I talk about giving and generosity, for me, it is not because I want something from you. It is because I want something for you. And I really believe that that's why God talked about the tithe in Scripture. It's not because he wanted something from you. The truth is God owns it all anyway. It's that he wants something for you. He wants you to be able to trust him with your money. The number 10 in scripture often has been related to tests like the plague or the 10 commandments, the tests of faith. And I think a tithe kind of fits in that mold. Now, some of your theologians, you know, say, well, hold on a second. I don't know if that's really a, a, a law in scripture. And I would say, well, I totally agree. It's a much broader concept than that. It was happening with Abraham and Melchizedek before the law was given. It was given as part of the Mosaic law. And then when Jesus came and was establishing the new covenant, Jesus actually affirmed with one of the, uh, the Pharisees, affirmed the tithe. And so if it's something that's happening before the law, during the law, and after the law, I think it's a pretty good practice for us as well, giving 10% of our income back to God. 
Now, I'm not the only one that thinks so. It's really interesting. David Bach, not even a Christ follower, wrote a book called Automatic Millionaire, and in it he says, give a tenth of your income away because it tends to be true. It will come back to you. Uh, we find that the most successful people are givers. It's just something that he has observed over time. I don't think he knows much about God at all. At least that's not what the authority that he was appealing to in his book. But what's interesting about what he noticed is that that principle is all throughout Scripture, this concept of when God gives a great challenge, he often gives a great promise to go along with it. And what God says is uh, many times when he talks about giving and sacrifice and that sort of thing, he will often follow it up with, hey, and there's a great promise that goes along with that. In Proverbs 3, 9 through 10, it says, honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. And you say, great, because I'm not a farmer. So that doesn't apply to me at all. But you don't say that because you're a lot smarter than that. And you know that that's a metaphor, right? And you know that what God is saying in there is, you know what, put me first in your finances and you will see promises, blessings begin to happen in your life. Now, I need to say this because we don't know each other all that well, is that you might look at me and say, oh, here we go. What you're saying is I give 10, 10 bucks and God's going to make sure I get 11 back. And I didn't say that at all. Because I think what God gives in his promises and that blessing, sometimes it's financial. In fact, there's a lot of people that would testify that what they've done with their tithing and how God has come back and changed their business or changed their life or changed their whatever, that will happen sometimes, but sometimes God blesses in a different way. See, this is why this is something that's really passionate topic for me. Even though it's just a practical topic, it's really passionate for me because do you know that 60% of people that get divorced, identify money as one of the key reasons why. You know, there are people that are in debt up to their eyeballs and they can barely sleep at night. Do you know there are people that are swimming in money and yet feel no purpose in their life, no joy, no peace, because they haven't figured out how to steward God's resources well so I think the promise comes, the blessing comes, but it's not always financial. Sometimes it's peace of mind. Sometimes it's peace in relationships. Sometimes it, it will manifest in a way I've heard people say, you know what, I've had cars that I feel like because of, they've just lasted longer. In fact, you know what, I've determined that the people that owned our house before us were tithers. Because our air conditioner is 22 years old. That was kind of a joke, but maybe it was just funny to me. I just, I just look at a 22-year-old air conditioner, and I'm like, this is a miracle. This is a modern-day miracle, the thing's still going. Anyway, or how about this is the joy of giving? Just the joy of generosity. Now, Jesus said it's more blessed to give than receive. I feel like you're getting quiet, you're getting a little tense, and that I'm stepping on your toes. So let me move on to the next point. Saving. Saving. You know, Social Security people will say that 2% of Americans reach retirement financially independent. 57% of us in the United States have $1,000 or less in savings. That's not right. 